I am so stoked that you are here for part two of a series we've called Better. Better. Last week was phenomenal, man. If you missed last week, the kickoff of this Better series that we're doing, God's plan is greater than my plan. I want to encourage you to go online, go on YouTube, go somewhere and watch it because it's going to catch you up and it's going to be very foundational to where we're going. The, the content we're going over in this four-week four week series is different than my book. It has the same title and everything, Better God's Plan is Greater Than My Plan. The books are on sale. They're on Amazon. They're in the lobby as well. But the four-week series that we're in is going to be all different content than what is inside the book. And here's the idea, though, that we're investigating, that we're looking at, man, at the beginning of another year, that instead of just doing our thing again and just getting our results, instead of just going for our goals, our vision, and our plans, what if we dedicated 2020 and we did something radical, man? What if we, was, we were so radical and we said, you know what? I'm not going to make a plan. I'm going to get on God's plan. Like every area of my life that is out of alignment with God, that I would bring it back into alignment. Every area of my, whether it's my relationships, it's my, it's my time management, it's my, it's my finances, my career, every area, I'm just going to say, God, what is your plan for my life? If you did that, Here's the challenge. If you did that, if you make 2020 the year that you got on God's plan, this is going to be the best year of your life. I promise you that, man. Why? Because God's plan is better than my plan. Here's this theme verse for the series, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 9, in the New Living Translation. says, we are confident you were meant for, say it out loud, you were meant for? That's what you were meant for. You weren't meant for just mediocrity. You weren't, you were meant to live a significant, meaningful life. God's plan for you when he designed you, when he created you, when he wrote your story, it was a good story. It was a better story than the one that many of us are writing for ourselves. God's plan for us is, is better. He has better things, things that actually come with this relationship with him. They come with salvation. It's contradictory to how we think better is and what our minds go to when we think of better, it, it's, it's not what you probably think it is very often because this world has a version of better for you. The enemy has a version of better for you. We're going to talk about that all throughout this series because it is contrast. The life that God has called us to live is contradictory. It's, it's contrast and flies in the face of what this world value system is, the culture of this world, definitely what the enemy has plan for us. In fact, the things that God has planned for you, the Bible says your mind can't even get there. Your mind can't even fathom, cannot wrap itself around. If you ever were to just align yourself with God, man, if you ever were to just say, okay, God, I'm going all in, you, you, would, you would attain and walk in a life that is so infinitely beyond what you can imagine. In fact, the apostle Paul wrote that in Ephesians chapter three. He said, now glory be to God who by his mighty power at work within us, and that's an important note, that, that this better things and this better life is not because of you started doing something better. It's not because you got better, you got smarter, you got stronger. All I'm all for that, man, self-improvement, work out, read more, all that stuff. But God is making it very clear that what he has for us is not something you can give yourself. What he, the better things he has for us is actually only attained by his spirit working inside of us and through us. His mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of. He goes on, he says, infinitely beyond, like, like it's just immeasurably beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, our hopes, like the life God has for you, you can't dream big enough for the better things that God has for you, for your future, for your purpose, your calling, for your family. And I would just say, don't, don't just hope for a better year. A lot of you, everyone does. Everyone does. Don't stop there, though. Hope is, hope is a motivator, not a strategy. You can't just go, man, I'm hoping. I'm hoping for a good year. Great. Hope, hope can get you starting, but hope alone won't get you there. It's not, okay? So, so don't just hope for a better year. You need, to, you need God's power. In fact, you, actually, you need God's power to reach your potential. You need God's power in order to reach your potential. 
I don't know if this was in your feeling, but here's, here's a principle. Inside of every person is potential. What you do with it is up to you. Inside of every person here, God has given you access to better things. They actually came with. It was a package deal. It came with salvation. For anyone here that is a child of God, it is, it is accessible to you. The infinitely beyond that God has, that mighty power, that far more than your hopes and dreams, far more than your thoughts, that is accessible. That is potential there. But most people never reach their highest potential, do they? Most people don't. Uh, many people, they, they have a hundred acres of possibility, yet they only keep one under cultivation. Just one. Let me give you a, a picture in your mind to, to think about when it comes to your potential. It's like a hot air balloon. You ever see the hot air balloons, big balloon with the basket? It's like that. It's, it's held down by these heavy sandbags, these hot air balloons. In order for you to reach your potential this year, in order for something different this year, guys, uh, uh, we, could, we can get something different. We can have something better this year if we just stop trying to do our way and we were to surrender to God and let his plan start happening in our life. But we have to identify, listen, the sandbags holding you down. There's some weight. There's some things that, that, that are holding you down and holding you back from reaching your potential, from you accessing that which is available to you by right through the power of the Holy Spirit. It is available to you. So, so let, me, let me help you out first and just give you a few areas on, on why we might not be walking in that. Why aren't we reaching our potential? And then I'm going to give you some countercultural thoughts on this, on how to actually access your potential. Write some things down with me. Why are we not reaching our potential, accessing better things? Number one, it's the choices we're making that actually limit us. It's not the people you're blaming. Somebody in here, please hear me. It's not the people you are blaming. It's not the circumstances that you're in. It's how you're responding to them. It's your choices that are limiting you. Okay, it's your choices that actually make you, and I don't care how talented you are, how gifted you are, how smart you are, your choices make you. Not any of those things, because every one of us here can probably think of a person or people in our life that are so talented, gifted, able, but are, are not living their potential because of the choices that they're making. Is that, can we all just even agree to that, 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 that there's people, it's not about that. It's not about the, how talented you are. It's the choices you make that make you. So I talked about this last week, that even happiness, happiness is a choice, not a goal. It's, it's, you can't have, and I know you want to be happy. A lot of you want to be happy in 2020. I do too. But you can't pursue happiness. You can't say, oh, I'm going after happiness in 2020. You ain't going to get it. What you need to start is right here. It's the choices that you're making. Start aligning your choices to the will of God for your life, and you'll get a byproduct of happiness. It's, it, there's studies now that say scientifically we make 5,000 decisions every day. Do you know that 5,000 decisions you're making every day, decision, 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 what would it look like, man, if we were just, if we just paused more, if we leaned into God a little bit more? Actually, Isaiah, Isaiah says that if we did that, we would hear a voice behind us whispering, this is the way, walk in it. Wouldn't that be so amazing if the choices we could make, that they were not because of my spontaneous decision or my thoughts, my intellect, or even from my will, but from the voice of of God. God, let me know the way and I'll walk in it. Our choices limit us from accessing the better things, the immeasurably more that God has for us. I love this quote by John Wooden. He says, there is a choice you have to make in everything you do. So keep in mind that in the end, the choices you make, make you. I love that poem, man. It's the choices you make that are making you. All of us are who we are today. We are the sum total of the choices that we've made up to this point. Joshua says it like this in chapter 24. If serving the Lord seems undesirable for you. So if God's plan still today, if God's plan seems undesirable for you, you're like, I don't know if I'm there yet. I don't know if I'm ready for that yet. Well, if it seems undesirable to you, then go ahead and choose for yourself this day who you will serve. There's some options for you. Here are the options. He says, whether the gods of your ancestors so you can continue to live your life and follow the, the pattern and the paradigms that were passed on to you. 
And a lot of us are living our lives based upon the patterns and the paradigms that were passed unto us. The, the, the patterns of thinking, the patterns of talking, the, the patterns of problem solving, the way we view the world around us, the habits even that we have, how we deal... It's what was taught to us by our parents or our grandparents or within our circumstances. We're just, we're following the gods that they worship before us. And so that's an option. He says, okay, you don't have to do God's plan. You can go ahead and continue to follow them, what they passed on to you, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're currently living. He says, you can follow the gods of the culture around you. You can, you can follow your your, your, the gods of your parents. You can follow the gods of the culture around you and just do the plan that culture, because culture has a plan for you. Do you know that? Culture's got a plan for your life. It's, and, and it's gonna tell you what to do and how to, how to do it, and that's a plan. You can go ahead and run that play. But here's what I'm encouraging you to say. Joshua says, I've seen it. I've tried it. So, but as for me and my house, we made a choice. And I'm encouraging you to make that choice today, to look culture in the eyes, to look your past in the eyes and face up to it and say, you know what, I've tried my plan and it don't work. As for me and my house, we will do God's plan. We will serve the Lord. Amen, somebody? Amen. When people don't reach their potential, though, and they're not, they're not living those better things kind of life, it's often because the choices that they're making. It's not that it's not available to them. It's the choices that we're making that, that are undermining God's plan for our life. Here's another reason. We get impatient with the process. We get impatient with the process. See, many people don't reach their potential because they didn't know it'd take so long. <laughs> and, and, and so everything is difficult before it becomes easy. Isn't that true? In every area of your life, everything is difficult before it becomes easy. What you need to do is stop trying to get in, in stop trying to instapot the process when God works by crockpot method. See, when you, when you get impatient with the process, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're revealing what you're saying to God. When we're impatient with the process, we're telling God, your timetable is wrong, mine is better. Do you see the pride in that? Do you see the arrogance in that statement? When we get impatient with the process and we try to get ahead of God and get, there, there are two realities concerning your potential. There are things that you have to work hard for and there are things you have to wait for. You got to have the wisdom to discern the difference, church. There are things you got to work hard for, and there are things that you're going to have to wait for. And one of the tragedies, I think, in our culture is that people are waiting for things that they have not worked hard for. I'm not even going to go there. You're not, you're not ready for that. Proverbs chapter 16 says this patience is what? Patience is better than power. God's plan is, is, is a journey. It's not an instapot. It's the crockpot. It's a process, okay? Impatience with the process will undermine our purpose. So let me give you a paradigm shift. Stop asking how long it'll take and start asking how far you can go. See, I think some of you have, you got this win in your mind. You're trying to, your win or your goal is always how quick. How can I, how can I get it? How can I get this done? How can I get it over with? How can I figure this out? Stop asking how long it's going to take and start asking God, how far can you take me, God? How much power can I see? How, where's the lid? Where's the capacity? God, how far can I go? Amen, somebody? Amen. Impatience with the process, though, will, will keep you from the better things, the immeasurably more, the potential that God has for you. Here's another one. Failure to pay the price. Failure to pay the price. You, you are, everyone is either, you're either playing or paying. Every one of you, you're either playing or paying today. You can either, you can play now and pay later, or you can pay now and play later. But either way, you cannot get around it. You're going to pay. Every one of us are going to pay, and for some of us, we're not, we're not getting the immeasurably more. We're not seeing it. Year after year is passing, and we're not seeing the better things because we're failing to pay the price. Here's a principle. For everything that you gain, you got to give up something. For everything you gain, and we're going to come back to this, this thought is threading through. Stay with me. For everything you gain, you got to give up something. The reason why we don't have better is because you're not willing to give up that something. 
The reason why you don't have the better things is because you're not willing to give up that some thing, whatever it is. For everything you gain, you have to give up something. Jesus said it like this in Luke chapter 9. He said to them all, now this is all, all means all, not just disciples, not just certain people, not just a portion of the crowd. He said to every person, whoever wants to be my disciple, you got to give up. You want to gain life, you got to give up your life. You want to gain better things, you need to give up your thing. You want to gain the immeasurably more, then you need to give up what you're currently holding on to. You must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Here's how Galatians, the Apostle Paul puts it. I have been crucified with Christ. What does that mean? That means I am not living my life my way. I'm not living my plan. I'm not doing it my way anymore. I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. Well, who in the world lives then? If you're not living, who's setting the course? Who's setting the, the New Year's resolutions? Who's creating the plan? But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is one of the reasons why we don't reach our potential, why we're not why we're not accessing the better things is because we're not willing to give up whatever it is that we're holding on to. Here's, here's another reason. Some of us are allowing our problems to define us. And when you allow your problems to define you, they will, they will defeat you. They will. Um, people are like tea bags. <laughs> Someone said, when you put them in hot water, you see what's really inside of them. A lot of us are, it's, it's, there's, the problem is, is that when you face, they will either, the problems you face will either defeat you or develop you. And it it's just determines how you respond to those problems. See, a lot of people, they, they, they fail to realize, they fail to see the problems for what they are. See, problems are just a teacher. So a lot of you are thinking of your problems as unwelcome guests into your life, and, and, and you got to stop looking at your problems that way. Problems are potential in disguise. Problems are a teacher in disguise. God, a lot of people, they fail to see the opportunity present in the problem. God, what are you trying to show me to do inside of me? Instead of seeing your problems as the problem, you need to see them as the potential. Don't be defined by your problems. Don't let your problems defeat you. Take them for the opportunity that they are. Look at Psalm 119. The psalmist says, my troubles, my problems, they turned out all for the what? for the best. Man, God has a beautiful way of doing that when you go all in and you give your life to him and you're living for his plan, not your plan. He has a beautiful way of turning bad things around to good, turning problems and pain around to your potential. They force me, look at this, I love the message paraphrase version, they force me to learn from your textbook. That's what problems did. Problems were, God, God has to turn the heat up on some of you to get to your attention. That's what he's saying. God has to turn that heat up and say, oh, okay, maybe I'll stop doing it my way and I'll start looking to the book. And I'll start looking to your, your word, for your textbook. Truth from your mouth means more to me than striking it rich in a gold mine, he says. So last week, I gave you a better choice to make for a better year. And we talked about how God just wants you to come home. We said, did the story. We, I shared with you the story of the prodigal son. We studied that. We just said no matter where you are, no matter how far that you've gone, how much distance you tried to put between you and God, no matter how, what, what you've done, God doesn't care how you come home. He just wants you to come home. Today, I want to give you another better choice that you're going to make that, that in order to have some better things. And I want to, before I, I teach you the principle, I want to show you the cultural lie, the contradiction that we're living with, the lie that culture is telling us. And you probably have a, you, you, every one of you have heard this lie. In fact, I will say, I'm going to say the first part of this lie, and you will get the, you'll probably be able to repeat it, okay? And it comes from the, the, the best flavor combination in the world. How many you know what the best flavor combination in the world is, anybody? <laughs> Peanut butter, chocolate, hallelujah, praise you, Jesus. Amen, somebody? That's heaven. That's heaven in a cup right here, you know what I mean? And so... So some of you guys will be able to, this is the cultural lie. Here's the cultural lie. I want you to repeat it, okay? If one is good, then two. 
Whoa, you got it. You got. You know what? So this is now. And, and here's the culture of lie. Two is always better. More is always better. Two is always better because if one is good, then two is. So if 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 one dollar is good, then two is. Is that if one car is good, then two is. And if one house is good, then two is. And if one wife is good, then two. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I just wanted to see if I could catch some of you slipping, but you caught it before I could go there. So, so let me show you. This is a cultural lie. This is a lie that has been deposited, listen, into humanity from, from the Garden of Eden. And we have been falling for this lie, and it's keeping you, I'm sure, it's keeping you from better things. It's not God's plan. Here's the lie. Let me show it to you. Back in the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, God created man and woman, and he gave them everything. Dominion. He gave them literally everything. Not only everything, they had dominion, but they had access to not just the things of the world, but they had access to God. They had to walk and talk and to relate to and to commune with. They had everything except one thing. One thing is all they didn't have. And the serpent comes and deposits this cultural lie that's been told to us over and over and over and over again throughout the generations. And the serpent says, I know you have everything you want, but what you don't have is what you need. Did you catch that? Because, because it's a lie that, that many of us need to identify in our life and how that has crept in and where it's crept in. See, you... you you have everything, but what you don't have is what you need to be happy. What you don't have is what you need to be happy. So why don't you go get what you don't have? Go get that. Go get what you don't have. Why don't you go do that? Because more, more is, is better. More is better. It's better for you. Here's, that's, that, that's, that's the lie. And if you want the immeasurably greater things that God has for you, the better things that actually come with salvation, not what the more this world has to offer, but comes through a relationship with God, you have to stop falling for the lie of, of the enemy, that more is, is better. Here's what the Word of God says, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 6. I want, let's say these three words, the first three words together. I highlighted them. One, two, three. Better one handful. One handful it is better to have one handful with tranquility with peace peace of mind peace of heart it is better than two handfuls with toil with stress with anxiety and with chasing the wind he says it is better it's better to have one handful because when i have one handful i got a i got a what i got a free hand so I got a free hand. I got margin in my life. It is better to live with margin because when I have one handful and, and somebody needs a help up, guess what I can do? I can help them up. When, when I live with one handful and someone needs some encouragement, I can, give them a, I can give them some encouragement. I can give them a pat on the back. If somebody needs a hug in their life, I'm not, I, I'm not, I have margin. I'm able to give them, I'm able to give because I have uh, better is one handful than two and just chasing after the wind. Here's the principle. It is better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. It is better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what does. See, you will learn this principle. You're either going to learn it the easy way or the hard way, church. You're going to either learn it today or you're going to learn it too late. The choice is up to you. I'm just giving you some choices in this series to help get you to some better things. And it is better to have one handful with peace, with tranquility, than two and chasing the wind, and two with regret, and two with looking back at another year and feeling like we missed it. It's not better. I thought it was going to be better, but it's not. It's, it's better to have. So this begs the question, right, then what? What doesn't matter and what does then? If it's better to have less of what doesn't matter and more of what, so I, so I can have more of what does, we need to actually identify some things, don't we? We got to identify what matters. We also have to identify what doesn't matter. So I want to help you navigate this, okay? I want you, so let me ask you a few questions and kind of help you navigate this, okay? Here's number one. Decide what is important. You have to decide 
What is important? I love that word important, man. That's such a great word, important. We, our lives are, for, for a lot of us, our lives are not shaped by what we believe is important. It's shaped by what is urgent. It's the things that are forcing their way in our life, like grabbing attention, like you need to do this, you need to do this, you should do this. It's not shaped by what we really believe is important. It's shaped by the urgent. See, no one on their deathbed ever wished they had more money. Do you know that? No one on their deathbed ever wished they, they could spend one more day in the office. Nobody. You got to decide what is important. You, listen, we can't lose our priorities. We can't let another year go by and lose our priorities of what is important. You're, when you lose your priorities, you will lose your potential. It robs us of our potential. And if you don't know what is important, let me help you out with this. Imagine with me, you go to the doctor. And the doctor tells you, I'm so sorry to give you the news. You have 30 days to live. How are you going to, how are you going to spend that last month of your life? Would you just imagine that with me? Because how you spend your final 30 days determines what is important to you. Determines what is most valuable to you. Okay, so... So while you're, writing that, while you're writing that down, and I put some space in your notes there for you to actually write this down. Because if you don't know what's important, look, the enemy has a plan for your life and will tell you what's important for you and other people have a plan for your life. But you need to decide what is important in your life. While you're thinking about that, I, I, I ask a question to the people, at least in my circle, and, and, and I ask them, what is most important? And, and the, the number one answer I got was, was things like God. God is the most important. Jesus, you know, him, his will, worshiping him, all that. And then like the second highest answer I got was um, about family, relationships, my kids. If I had 30 days to live, and that's what I want to do. I don't want to be with my kids, be with my, my family. It was the people that they loved in their life. And then kind of a, the, the third most was like making a difference category, if you will. I want to make Jesus known. In my last 30 days, I want to help people with their eternal life kind of thing. It's, what shocked me, though, was not on the list of what people said was most important. And it might shock you, because not, not one person that I asked said what was most important to them was money. Not one person. Not one person said, oh, my last 30 days, I'd like to buy more stuff. My possessions. I, you know, in the last 30 days, if I got 30 days to live, I want that countertop, that new kitchen countertop. I want to upgrade to marble, man. That's what I want to do in my last 30 days, or my car, or my house, or my, no one said, no one said, I own my high score on Clash of Clans, or the, I wish I was the world champion of Fortnite. That's what I want to finally do and get to on my last 30 days. No one, no one said that. Here's the thing. What I believe, you guys, is that we're living our life, a lot of the stuff that we're pursuing are not on the list you're making. A lot of the stuff you are pursuing, the things that are, that are taking up your time and your space and your day are not on the list that you are making of what is most important. I want to encourage you to define that clearly. What is, what is, what is in the one hand? Instead of just grabbing after everything that, that there is to offer and everything that the enemy and the culture and everybody is, is yes, 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 yes. Identify, you only got one hand. Identify what you're going to put in that, in that hand. Here's what the Apostle Paul had to say about it in Philippians chapter 3. He says, but whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. He said, you know what, I... I went after some things, but I thought it was better, and it wasn't better. That stuff ain't worth, like, like, it's not worth what I thought it was. And he continues, what is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness. He says, man, I went after some, some things I thought was better, but then when I went after God's things, not only was it better, it was surpassingly greater. And if you've never tried this life in God's plan, then you're missing out on surpassing greatness. He says, this is surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, all those things that I thought were important. I consider them rubbish that I may get to know Christ. Can I tell you a secret here in, in deciding what is important and living, living your life based upon what you really value? Um, you'll never change your life for the better until you start changing what you do daily. 
I mean, can, I you, can I give you a little nugget, a secret here? Because a lot of you have, you got dreams and ambitions up here, but when you're so big, you're not changing what you're doing daily, so your habits are not reaching the level of your dreams. And until you start changing your habits, the things you habitually do every day, you will never really see the greater things. You'll never really see the better things, the immeasurably more things, until you take those things that you say are important and you let it drive your daily decisions. So let me, let me give you what's called the rule of five. I want to give you my rule of five. And this isn't new to me. This is something that I learned. And I said, I, want, I need to live by this. The rule of five is you pick five things that are going to be a part of your day. What are most important to you? These five things you're going to do every day. What are most important to you? And this doesn't have to be your five. This is my five. This, this is what I believe is most important. So every day, I'm going to live by a rule of five, meaning I'm going to do these five things every day. Here they are. Here's my rule of five. Not in your notes, but up here. I'm going to spend time in prayer every day. I'm going to spend time in my word every day. Why? Because God matters. Because my life, my relationship with God matters. So every day, I'm going to make time for what I say is important. I'm going to love those closest to me. Why? Because my marriage matters. My marriage is important. My kids are important. So I'm going to love them. Every day, I'm going to talk to them. I'm going to know their friends' names. I'm going to know what they ate. I'm going to know what they, what they like and what they don't like. I'm going to know my kids and have a relationship with my kids because they're important. So I make time every day to love my kids, to love my wife, to love those closest to me. Every day, I'm going to make a difference. Every day. Why? Because it's important, man. I want my life to matter. God made me for better things. Amen, somebody? And, then, and every day I'm going to take care of myself because I'm no good if I'm not healthy. When you fly on the plane, they tell you, if the plane is going down, you put on what? Your oxygen mask first. Because you're no good to your neighbor dead. Okay, so every day I'm going to take care of myself. I'm gonna, whether that's working out, eating healthy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of myself so I can be the best version of me for the people closest to me and God's purpose for me. Amen, somebody? Amen. So, hey, Decide what's important because it's better to have one handful than two and chasing the wind. It's better to have less of what doesn't matter so I can have more of what does. So what is in my hand? It's what does matter. It is what is important. But many of us here today are living a two-handful life. That's okay. Many of us are. I was for a long time living a two-handful life. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give it was just more and more and, and more. So we have to go on to this next step, which is, you got to let go of what's in the other hand. If it doesn't matter, let, let go of what doesn't matter. And I believe the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is going to help us with the power to let go of some things that just don't matter. We have to let go and exchange the things that don't matter for the things that do. Hebrews chapter 12 says it like this. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. He's saying there's some things that are holding you down. There are some sandbags that are holding you down. It's tangling you up from running the race with perseverance. I love that he says that it's marked out for us. Do you know that God has a race marked out for you that is unique to you? That God has a plan, a journey, and a process that is unique to you. He has a plan of better things, of greater things. You were put on this earth to do something significant. And here's what the enemy will do. Along the process, along the journey, the enemy is going to say, hey, what about that? What about that? You need that. What about that? Why don't you go get some of that and just... And then eventually the year is going to go and the weeks and months are going to pass and we're going to be chasing the wind yet again. Chasing the wind, grabbing hold of two handfuls. You have to have the discipline to throw down that which doesn't matter. That word cast off is actually, in, in, the, in the Greek, it, it's a violent throwing. To violently throw down is what he's talking about. So what are the things, what are the sandbags holding us down from our potential, holding us back from better things? If there are things entangling us from running this race marked out for us with perseverance, what are some of those things? Let me give you three areas for you to think through to get rid of some of those things, some of the sandbags. Here's number one, some sandbags you need to cut back. There are some areas of your life that you need to just cut back from. And I don't know what it is for everybody, but for most people, can I just give you two things that for most of us in here would apply? Your spending and your schedule. I believe every one of us here can probably cut back on our spending and our 
schedules, for our spending, our, we, need, we need more financial margin in our life. It is better to have one handful with money left over than two and divorced, okay? And two in the pain and strain and financial heartache. It's so, it's so dumb for us to, to, to spend all of our money trying to impress people we don't even know. And then at the end of it, we're, we're, we're wondering, I don't have any money. Where'd my, all my money. Where'd all my money go? For a lot of us here, we need to downsize. We need to downsize our life. I'm telling you, it's way better to have financial room to breathe. It is better to have one handful in your schedules. Your schedules. Listen carefully. For some of you, it's time to get very prayerful and very aggressive and what to cut back from in your schedule. Because everything that is offered to you or your kids, you don't need to take. More is not better. Oh, but piano. But, 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 you know, more baseball. A year round now? Year round baseball now. Let's do that. Yes, 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 yes. And then what you're doing, you're just choosing, you're choosing a plan. You're choosing a plan. Is it better? Is it better? They said that, that kids that are raised in church, if you raise your kid in church, you make it a priority to raise your kid in church, they are 75% more likely to attend church as an adult. Look, parent, all you got to do is get them here. Get them here. Don't, don't follow the enemy's plan for your kid's life. More is not always better. You got to learn how to cut back. The common answer when you ask people, how you doing is what? Oh, I'm busy. Oh, I'm busy. That's just the common answer. You never, when's the last time you went up to someone and said, how you doing? They're like, dude, I'm so relaxed. I got so much time. I got so much time, my man. I don't know what to do, man. I'm just so chill, dude. Took up fishing and golfing. It's just, I don't know. No, no, we're just so inundated. Here's, here's the principle. I have to say no to many good things in order to say yes to the better things. I got to learn to say no. They could be even good. They're good for me. They're good for my kids. They're good. But I have to say no to good things in order to say yes to the better things. Just because you could do something doesn't mean you should. Cut back. Here's the next thing some of you need to do. Some of you need to throw out. You just need to throw out some things. Some, some of you need to throw out a lot. You need to clean the clutter. Your closets are full to the brim. So I got a friend who has a closet that's bigger than my kid's you know, bedroom, you know, it's just ridiculous the amount of things that we have. And then we got so much for the closet, it don't fit there. So we move it to the garage and now we need to get more shelves for the garage. Honey, I need more shelves. And there's, let's get more shelves. And then it don't fit in the garage anymore. And we got to go get a storage unit now. Why? Because more is better because stuff is good. Stuff is better. And we like stuff. Stuff is, stuff is better. More <laughs> is better. Okay. Stop managing. Some of you don't need to manage this part of your life. Oh, I wish I could manage this stuff. Don't, some of you don't need to manage it. You need to get rid of it. Don't manage it. Throw it out. Don't start to manage this area. Once you throw it out, now you can start managing, okay? Right now, it's time to throw some stuff out so you can get your life managed up bull, okay? Don't manage that stuff. Somebody just needs to get to chuck it, man. Just chuck some stuff, all right? And then here's, here's the last thought. Some things you need to turn off. We'll decide what's not, what's, what's not, what doesn't matter. Some things you got to cut it out, throw it off, or turn it off. What do you need to turn off? The TV, maybe. Maybe you need to turn off the TV. You're wasting your mind and your time. No one changed the world watching reruns. <laughs> okay? Just, just turn, turn off what? Turn off your cell phones, maybe. My wife would tell me all the time, honey, get off your phone. I'm like, honey, I'm changing the world here. Stop it. <laughs> Woman, I'm changing the world. I'm talking to people. This is good stuff. And I had to learn. I had to learn that that more is not always better. More is not always better. You, we put the phones down. We put them away. We sit down and have dinner and a conversation with our kids. Hey, you could change your kids' lives, parents, probably just by this principle. Just turn stuff off. Just turn it off. If you could, if you could change the life of your child by turning off the TV and YouTube and games and phones and just sitting down and having dinner and having some conversation together, I'm telling you right now, you did that, that would be just monumental paradigm shift, future changing, destiny altering shift that you would make to just, it's all tangled up. We're tangling ourselves up in stuff and more, and it's better to have less of what doesn't matter so I can have more of what does. Here is the third, third thing that we need to do, you guys, and that is to fight for what does matter. Decide what's important, let go of what doesn't matter, and start fighting for what does matter. It's time 
to fight. To fight for what, though? To fight for what matters. I love what Nehemiah says when Sabalot and Tobias were trying to get at them and trying to get them from to stop building the wall. And Nehemiah said, no, it's time to fight. We're going to do what God has called us to do. Nehemiah chapter 4 says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome and say it out loud and come on, man of God, it's time to fight. Come on, woman of God, fight like the woman of God you are for your family, for your, look, fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, for your wives and your homes. It's time to fight. Your life is too valuable. Your God is too good. Your calling is too great for you to not fight for it. Amen, somebody? For you to just give in to the culture. It's better. It's better to have one handful and and, and healthy marriage. It's better to have one handful and kids that you know it's better to have one handful and in, in, in the ability to make a difference with your life. It's better to have one handful and in, in, in intimacy with friends. It's better to have one handful in a relationship with God. It's better to have one handful than two and just chasing the wind and toil and stress and anxiety and depression and greed and more and chasing the wind. It is infinitely better. God's plan is better than my plan. Can I pray for you, church? Go ahead and bow your heads. Let me pray for you.